Welcome to Champion Minded, the podcast for those who aim for excellence, not only in the sports arena, but in life. My name is Alistair McCaw, author, speaker, mindset and performance coach, and my goal is to help you unleash your unlimited potential and provide you with the tools to achieve greatness. Are you ready to become Champion Minded? Then let's do this. Hey everybody, welcome to the Champion Minded Podcast. I'm Alistair McCaw. Um, usually I would say I'm your host, but uh, today we've got something pretty exciting. Um, I will be the one on the other side of the mic. And um, let me give you a little bit of background to, to today's podcast. Uh, I was contacted by uh, Andrew Stringer, uh, who's playing football at the moment over in the UK. He's Canadian. And I often get these emails and I, I um, it's always difficult to, to answer um, so many emails and I appreciate everybody who, who writes through with with questions um, and you know I've been finding lately I've been getting this the same type of questions and the same emails which I appreciate from every single one of you who take the the time and the effort but um, about sports performance and how I got into the role I do and my work with with professional athletes and teams and uh, also my experience as as an athlete as well so um, I thought this would be the best way and the most economical way to uh, answer a lot of those <laughs> those emails and those questions. And um, you know, Andrew put together a, an amazing bunch of questions. He put a lot of time into it. He put a lot of effort into it. And I thought it would just be a great opportunity to um, have uh, the roles reversed and uh, Andrew interviewing me. So uh, with uh, no further uh conversation from my side on the introduction i'm going to bring in andrew andrew how's it going all good man thanks for uh thanks for taking the time out to uh to talk to you man no uh, you're, you're most welcome um like i said uh your email um thank you for that and obviously the questions i just thought you know this is just an ideal opportunity so great job oh cheers man i appreciate it um but like you said you get a ton of emails so hopefully i'm able to um we're able to get quite a few answers out of you so everyone can get quite a bit of uh, information about what you're doing right now. Cool stuff. All right. So over to you. <laughs> oh, thanks, man. So, I mean, the main reason why I emailed you is because I'm, you know, really interested in, you know, the mindset and performance aspect of sport and, um, you know, with your, your tweets and, and your podcast, especially, um, I thought who better than to, to ask yourself. So with that, my, main question would be what got you interested into you know mindset and performance type stuff mm. um i mean it all started for me at a very young age uh probably the age of uh, eight nine years old where i was introduced to to tennis from from my brother and um you know from a very very young age i had a burning desire to be a professional athlete or a professional uh sports person and uh, my first sport was tennis but i played a lot of sports in school and and being brought up in South Africa, you get you get exposed to a lot of sports. But um, I think from a very very young age, uh, I always had a, a a burning desire to be um, the best in something, and I, I already had that at like I said nine ten years old. And it just wasn't a dream or an idea. I really uh, would do extreme things and and train harder, and I would have newspaper. Uh, routes. I'd deliver the newspaper early in the morning at 5:30, and in the evening, and sometimes I'd even run those uh, newspaper rounds instead of <laughs> instead of take my bike. Yeah, um, I mean, what what ten year old does that? But um, I think my my interest in mindset and performance starts that early. If I really have to dig down and think about it, because wow. uh, we couldn't afford uh, coaches. Um, you know, we, we had immigrated from uh, Belfast, Northern Ireland to Johannesburg, South Africa. And we didn't have a lot of money in the family. I mean, we weren't broke, we weren't poor, but there wasn't a lot of money to go around for the, um, what I would call the extra luxuries. And, and coaching is one of those things. To pay for coaching for a sport is a luxury, which I think a lot of kids these days maybe don't realize and, and take for granted that uh, to have a coach is um, is a privilege. And I never had those. So I can always remember from, from a young age actually sitting uh, alongside tennis courts um, within my vicinity of my house and listening to coaches uh, coach players. 
And what I'd do is I'd sneakily write down things that they'd said in, in, in the practice. And this is, again, this is when I was 10, 11, 12 years old. And I'd go and practice those things. I'd sometimes sneak under the fence at the tennis club and hit against the wall for hours and look at my notes at what the coach had told that player the previous day. And, um, you know, I think that curiosity and that mindset was built from those small little beginnings of um, I had a burning desire myself. I had intrinsic motivation. I didn't need my parents to tell me to go play sports or, or anybody else. I wanted to do that. Um, and then around about the age of, of say, 14, um, I got to a good level in tennis. I got to around about 11, 12 in the country uh, in my age group. But the financial burden was just too much. You know, you're breaking strings on, on the rackets. You're going through shoes like crazy. Um, yeah. And it was just, it was, we just couldn't afford it. And so I decided to take up running because I thought, okay, what's the cheapest sport that's not going <laughs> to cost me anything because I know I have the work ethic and mentality to become uh, really, really good in something. So I took up running. And um, there it's a much more, uh, what's the word, economically favorable sport where coaching doesn't cost much. Um, you're usually in groups. So, you know, even I can remember the subscription of the club being around about like $15 a year to use the track. And right. uh, my newspaper rounds could pay for that back then. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, I think, you know, I can even remember at those young ages keeping journals about what I was eating and how it can improve my performance. And, you know, back then there was no social media. I couldn't go on YouTube to learn much. So sure. I would I would cold call people. I would read newspapers, magazines, anything I could get my, my hands on to improve my performance. So I think to answer your question, curiosity. Um, burning desire. I wanted to be uh, the best I could be at a very, very young age, and nobody put that upon me. Wow, that's uh, that's unreal for a, for a, like you said, a ten year old to to take on that kind of um, I guess self responsibility of their own game is um, probably, especially in this day and age, not even heard of. Um, but do you, how was it then? Do you think that aided you as a as an athlete then being able to kind of listen to other coaches and, and uh, apply those things to yourself. Did that really, you think help you in, in that sense? Yeah. I mean, there was no other choice because, you know, we couldn't afford the coaching and, and, you know, back in South Africa, back in the eighties, early nineties, there wasn't really um, that much support. So, you know, if you weren't the number one or two in the country, you weren't getting the support of the Federation. So, right. you know, there was just no other ways. And if you really want it bad enough, you will find a way. You will you will do whatever it takes. I mean, I can remember, like I said, we couldn't afford um, the, tennis, the tennis courts uh, uh, subscription yearly. So I would get there early in the morning. I'm talking 5 o'clock, 5.30, sneak under the fence to go practice against the wall and, and just – you know, just things like that. I'd I would look for tennis balls that were in the field next door that people had hit over. All these, all these type of small things. But just a, you know, one of the things that really is a key attribute to a great athlete is hunger. And right. you know, you can be the most skilled, the most talented, but if you don't have hunger, you're not willing to do what it takes. You just don't have the motivation. You don't have the inspiration. Um, you won't make those crazy choices and, and do whatever it takes. And hunger for me is the number one attribute of, of a great player. Wow. Love that. I mean, the, the, the very best players in any sport, like you said, there, there's something deep within them that, that the, I guess you would say the average players don't have. And, um, that, I guess that starts at, for most of them, a, a very early age, like yourself, um, which kind of drives them throughout the rest of their career. Um, so I think that, yeah, that's, that's fascinating that you started doing all this stuff as such a young kid. Um, yeah. But, and, and you know, this is something Andrew that I, that I tell uh, parents is that, you know, they're, they're, they're trying all these things and they're, they're, you know, should we get, get a fitness trainer for our kid and should we get this, should we get that? And I'm saying, you know, and you see the kid that, some of them don't even want to be there and, and yeah. you know they're just pushing their kid 
in the wrong direction and you know that kid's not going to be around at 14 15 playing sports yeah and you know when you're working with kids you're working with parents you're not you the, the kid is the person that's maybe standing in front of you um, getting coached but you are working with the parents in regards to the decisions and that kid is only going to listen to the parents regardless yeah. who you are as a coach and you know if if we as coaches can't get through to the parents and do not have a connection with the parents and they're not willing to take on board what they're, they're telling you then you know it's it's useless and I can't tell you how many um, uh, p- uh, relationships if you want to call it between me and 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 parents where I've just said you know I don't think this is going to work because the advice I'm giving you uh, you're not taking you're going other directions and you know and that's fine that's your kid that's your your journey but you know um, a lot of parents unfortunately push their, their their kids out of sports because of um, you know it's it's more the parents dream than the kids dream absolutely yeah definitely so then I'm assuming here that your transition from going from an athlete into more of a coaching role, was that a generally smooth transition then? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, like I said, I took up running and then from there I took up uh, duathlon and triathlon, which is biking and running and swimming. Um, right. I was more a duathlete, but um, I, had a, I had a fairly decent career. I raced five world championships. I was two times national champion. Um, I raced a lot of powerman races around the world, so I had a really good career. But uh, during that time, I still had to work, and I started as a fitness trainer. Actually, my I, I had multiple jobs as a kid uh, during my teenage years. Um, oh, I worked as a mascot for a, for a soft drinks company. Um, I worked in in uh, t- uh, takeouts. I flipped burgers. I took tickets at the cinema. I served drinks at the squash courts. I worked in an electrical store called Leprechaun, oh, um, and that was pretty funny because I was I was Irish, and um, I worked multiple jobs to pay for what, what I like to call my sports habit. And right. um, so, you know, when I was 18, 19, I was working two jobs. I was uh, wait, waiting tables in the evening, and I was working as a fitness trainer during the day. And um, and then in between, I'd, I'd, I'd put my training in. So I was having 15, 16-hour days of, of work and, and training. And, and somehow it all worked. But yeah, to answer the question, the transition from an athlete to a coach was happening at, when I was still competing. And again, I would be coaching myself. I would be using myself as a, as a guinea pig and, and um, you know, uh, okay, that didn't work. Okay, my, um, my ankle screwed or, um, uh, you know, whatever it may be, that didn't work. And I'd have to change it. So I was using myself as that as that guinea pig and then on the other side the the mindset side um you know a lot of times i was by myself i would be in countries by myself i'd be i'd be you know there was it was damn expensive to make a phone call back home uh, yeah. in those days you know back in the 90s before cell phones and mobile phones it was so <laughs> expensive so i wouldn't speak to family for weeks and months on end and just i'd be by myself in some terrible little place in in Europe somewhere and and living in in attics and and on on the floor just to to make it happen yeah and do you think you know, those experiences of, of you being by yourself in these places did that think aid in your mental toughness as as an athlete because I, I assume in that kind of those endurance type of um, sports the mental toughness is is just at a different level altogether Oh yeah, and and you know here's the thing, Andrew. I didn't realize I was building that type of mindset and that mental toughness when I was younger because there was no other choice. Right. You know, there, uh, that's how it was. And if I wanted to fulfill my my vision and my dreams and my goals, I had to make it happen. I didn't have mommy and daddy supplying backup. I I mean, I never stayed in hotels. Um, I. You know, for me, it was a, for me today. I'm still grateful and appreciative when I get on an airplane, and I get on an airplane probably, I'm not kidding you, probably a hundred times a year now because of wow. because of the job and the work and consulting I do, and I am appreciative and grateful every time I step on a plane and every time I go into a hotel. It's almost like Christmas Day for me because I'm like I never had that as a kid, and and in a way, and, and this might sound fi- quite funny, but I almost feel to myself. Wow, you know, I've made it. I'm I'm staying in a hotel. How cool is this? And 
you know, I think kids today, when I speak to them, they just look at me as if to say, man, this guy's nuts, man. I don't know what he's, what he's on, but, um, yeah, just uh, appreciation. Absolutely. And I mean, you, you said the key word there you said was, was grateful gratitude. And I mean, in your, in your tweets and your podcasts and the content you put out, you talk about gratitude quite a bit. Um, you know, how, how big of a, you know, what's the impact you feel that gratitude takes on, on a person as in sport or in life in general? Um, gratitude is a game changer. Appreciation is a game changer. You know, I, I come across so many athletes and, you know, I've, I've written two books where I talk about this, um, especially in champion minded where I talk about uh, enjoying the journey. And, you know, one of the biggest regrets of, of athletes after their career is that they, they, they wish they'd enjoyed the journey more. They wish they'd enjoyed the everyday process more. And I think where a lot of the joy is lost in players and athletes is expectation and pressure they put on themselves. And, you know, the next result, the next ranking, um, the next funding, all this pressure the whole time. And you can't perform optimally with uh, too much pressure. Pressure is important. Pressure make helps you perform. Yeah. But if you're burdened by the pressure, if you're not embracing the pressure, you exhaust yourself mentally and physically. A worrying about things that are not there. Pressure is something that hasn't arrived yet. It's something that you're manifesting in your mind of all the things that could go wrong and all the things that, that might happen. And, um, you know, I always tell people, Instead of focusing on expectation, focus on appreciation. And when you, when you focus on appreciation, you enjoy what you do more on a daily basis. And I've had athletes who have all the skills, but they're just burdened by pressure, anxiety, expectation. And I said, right, the first thing you need to do is identify where your pressure is coming from. Is it yourself? Is it is it?" parents is it someone around you what is it identify that because that is that is the first protocol um and then obviously to focus on appreciation and what i get them to do andrew is i get them to journal and yeah. you know uh in the morning things they're grateful for uh, uh, which is part of appreciation and then in the evening to self-reflect write down two or three things that you did well today that you appreciate people that helped you move one step closer to your goal and, and, and helping you along in life. I mean, how, you know, one of the, the number one cause of people leaving jobs and careers in the United States is lack of appreciation. It's not um, their salary, what they're getting annually. It's not the days off they're getting. It's appreciation. And athletes can learn from this is that when you appreciate more, you enjoy the journey and you take care of the everyday process. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I mean, when do you find that when your athletes start to, to practice um, gratitude, you know, writing those three things they're grateful for in the morning, and then those, those three things in the evening that, you know, as they do it, they start to, to kind of notice a lot more things they're grateful for throughout the day. I mean, sometimes it might be a struggle to, to find three things. Yeah. Um, you know, here's, you here's the funny thing. Here's the funny thing. And this has also got to do with habits. Appreciation is a habit. The way you think is a habit. You, you have to, you have to stick with it. It's like you, you know, you play football, you have to stick with learning a skill, repetition, repetition, repetition. Yep. A lot of people, um, think great okay i'm gonna get a journal exciting they go out buy this fancy journal it's got nice you know the girls like a nice pink journal with nice puppies on it and the guys they go get a, a more a more serious journal with a black cover <laughs> whatever it may be they're excited and they do it for a week and then they forget a little one or two days and then they do it again and then it's it's forgotten yeah. and you know appreciation is the act of a habit of you consciously thinking about that thing over and over and and putting it into practice on a daily basis and that's why it's so important to have uh your journal or whatever it may be in front of you every single day somewhere where you sit every day somewhere that you see it every day just like it's important to see your goals every day right and um to answer your question those who have and it's not many 
that's maybe less than 10% of people I consult because I can't live their life for them. I can give them the tools, but yep. I can't make them appreciate things. That is up to them. I can't control what they do on a daily basis. But to answer your question, yes, the 10% that will take it on see a drastic change in their happiness, in their yep. relationships, in their performances, in their energy, in their attitude, in their ability to uh, work together with others. Appreciation is the game changer. And then you, you would say that all with all those positive changes, that's, that's, there's no way that can't not help your game or help your performance. Well, that's it. Uh, I mean, you're, you're, you, you, when you have more energy, let, let's put it this way. Um, doubt, worry, judgment, um, content, all these things require a lot of energy. They require a lot of negative energy. And this is why I'm so big on, on telling people, uh, it doesn't matter, athletes, anybody, is protect what you listen, watch, and read every day because that is an energy source. You know, politics, all these things, all this negativity on, on, on television. You know, when you switch mm -hmm. on the TV in the morning, it's 10 to 1, negative to positive. You're wow. filling your brain, you're filling your mind with negativity before you step out the door. And, yeah. you know, this is where it starts, uh, is your energy, um, protecting your energy, because when you have energy, you can perform at a better level. You have more uh, enjoyable relationships and more productive relationships with people because you're not moody, you're not judging, you're you're you know you're just in a better frame of mind. No, exactly. Um, you saying there, you know, listening to you know the the I guess the sources of of information you're taking in, and you're talking about um, you know practicing good habits as gratitude being one of those good habits. You talk a lot about you know daily routines or your some would say your non-negotiables. Um, I know you may have, you, you touched on it sometimes in, in your podcast as to what your daily routines might, um, you know, might happen. But what, could you just give us a, like a refresher of what your daily routines are or your non-negotiables that you just, you know, gets your day started? Yeah. I think the most important thing is, is, and I don't like to overwhelm people with information and that's one of, my goals in writing books as well as simplicity is yep. um, a morning routine. Start there. If you don't have a morning routine, start there. And I have what I call uh, the three for me. And I get up at five o'clock and I make sure that I get four things done before I leave, I leave the house. Um, and that is uh, thoughtfulness. I, I spend 20 minutes thinking about others. I stretch or do some exercise, which which sometimes I can go to the gym. I know I just said before I leave the home, but let's say before I start work at 8 o'clock, which is my choice, I make sure these four things are done. So thoughtfulness, number one. Number two, um, exercise. And, you know, sometimes I might be in a hotel. I might be somewhere else where I only have 20 minutes or I do have more time. But the, the minimum requirement and the non-negotiable is 20 minutes. Right. Um, number three I will make sure I have time for a good breakfast because we speak about energy. That's where it starts is, is, um, is your breakfast. And the fourth thing I do, uh, in, in my, um, in my twenties is I read, I read in the morning and it can be something spiritual, can be something motivational, can be something linked to my career, whatever it may be, but I get some reading done. So I call it the four by twenties, non-negotiables. They need to be done every day. Uh, no matter where I am in the world. Wicked. Love that. Um, going back to your third one, your breakfast, um, what what does that usually entail for you? Do you keep it simple? Do you go a little bit more complicated? What do you look for? Yeah, I like to I like to have uh, some oatmeal. And I, I also travel with my, my food and my breakfast as well when I go places because um, – I still see my body as an athlete and I still treat myself as one because I still need to perform. And this yeah. is a message I bring forward to coaches, teachers, whatever career you may be in. If you want high performance, then treat yourself like an athlete. So I, you know, I'm not saying it has to be extreme of, of you know, tr carrying your food everywhere, but make better choices because I need to be in control of what I'm doing. If I'm leaving the house without proper food, or I'm going somewhere, I'm being controlled by that environment. I have to buy or I have to purchase, which is something that's maybe not, not healthy. 
So yeah. I don't want to be in that frame of mind because I need to be the same person I am at eight o'clock in the morning as I am at six o'clock at night. I owe that to my client. I owe that to that person that's paying good money standing in front of me. I can't be faded out, exhausted, tired at five o'clock in the afternoon and expect to charge what I do. But right. um, my breakfast, oatmeal, uh, blueberries, raspberries, strawberries. I like I like mixed fruit in there, and I'll I'll have a protein shake as well. And if I'm really really hungry, I'll um, I'll whip up some eggs as well. But I'll never take the the made the made eggs in um, in restaurants, especially in those those buffet type of style. Oh yeah, yeah. It's full of butter. It's sometimes yeah. you, sometimes you don't even know if it's real eggs. It's powdered <laughs> eggs. Um, if there is, if, if I'm really, really lucky and I'm staying in a nice hotel where, um, they might be making eggs, there's, there's maybe a chef there, then I'll get egg whites made. So yeah, I'm very, very particular with, with my breakfast and the quality of it. And so that's, you would say that's more, that's leading by example. So when you talk to coaches, telling them they have to look after themselves, that's basically you're, what you're looking at you know, how leading by example on, on all fronts, not just maybe in the, whatever the training session or the game days, but just like a total lifestyle, you would say that you're trying to lead by. Yeah. Um, again, uh, and you're going to hear this word come up and you've heard it a few times is energy. My, my, my performance is linked around energy, physical energy, mental energy, spiritual energy, all these things I protect, and those are the most important tanks for me. Relationships is another tank. I protect my relationships of who I spend time with and who I spend less time with. Um, you know, if you're just giving yourself up for people the whole time, that requires energy. And this is something I pass on to, to athletes or, or anyone for that matter who wants high performance is protect your energy. It yeah. starts there. Uh, where you spend your time, who you spend your time with the food that you eat, the recovery that they have, the quality of the sleep that you have, all these things. Perfect. Love that. Um, going back, let's see here. Let's um, talk about lessons learned. So as an athlete, I, I assume as an athlete and a coach, I would think they're two very different worlds. Um, so what would be the biggest lesson learned for you looking back as an athlete? And then what's the biggest lesson you've learned probably as a coach? Uh, let's see. Um, biggest lesson I learned as an athlete is you got to have a vision. You've really got to have a vision. For me, it was always seeing myself standing on the top of a podium um, as a world champion, uh, Olympics, whatever it may be. But you got to have a vision. That was the biggest lesson. That drove me every day because motivation is fleeting. You know, sometimes yeah. you wake up and you're not motivated. Sometimes I wake up, I'm not motivated. But my vision and my purpose to impact as many people as possible, to change lives, to to change mindsets, to improve the quality of life, these that's what drives me drives me now. But yeah, as an athlete, it was definitely the the, the having a vision um, or a dream. Some some like to talk about it, but when I yeah. I don't like the word dream because dreaming is sleeping. And sleep, sleeping uh, doesn't get you your dreams or it doesn't, doesn't fulfill your, your vision. So I like to say, you know, while some are dreaming, some are working for it. Love that. But <laughs> um, as a coach, uh, one of the lessons I've learned as a coach, oh, I've learned many, um, is I think the biggest one is put yourself in the shoes of the person standing in front of you always as much as you can. Be constantly... Um, putting yourself in their shoes, how they're feeling, why they're feeling that way. Um, uh, you know, empathy. Empathy mm -hmm. is the big one. That's the big one for, for me as a coach. And uh, I didn't pick it up straight away. You know, I would say the last five years, because I appreciate things more and more grateful, that opened my eyes to really, really trying to understand other people and get into their shoes more. And understand right. it from their side because at the end of the day it's not about me it's about them yeah and I think would you agree that some coaches find that they take it upon themselves that it is more about them than it is the players oh absolutely okay, um, I mean yeah I mean obviously to to climb the ladder and to want to get ahead um, you know some of the advice I give to 
to coaches is if you want to get, you know, and I, this is another question I get a lot by, by um, listeners to the podcast or, or people that email me is how do I get to where you are? How do mm. I get to work with um, professional athletes and the Kevin Andersons and all these type of people? Well, you know, my advice is always no matter who's in front of you right now, be it a kid, be it a recreational center, be it a club, whatever, do your best for that person or those people in front of you right now. Because when you take care of what you're doing right now, that will give you the opportunity to go further. Um, you know, if you're just fixed on wanting to work with professional athletes, you are robbing yourself and you're trying to like take shortcuts. Yeah. Um, let me tell you, at the top, working with the best athletes, they find you out very quickly if you don't know your stuff and you don't have the years and years of failures and mistakes and whatever it may be, not just in exercises, not just in tactics and, and technique, but just decisions. Right. I think the big the big thing for me is my mistakes have helped me make better decisions for my athletes today. Right. Wow. Um, so what would you say is the most fulfilling part of your job that I'm working with these with these top athletes what's the most fulfilling part of that um i would say seeing them achieve things that they maybe didn't feel they could achieve and and for example um right now uh you know we're speaking um you know uh, on semi-final days of wimbledon and a player i've worked with for four years kevin anderson has just won his his match in six and a half hours uh to to play in the final on sunday and you know kevin four or five years ago was not a player who deeply believed in himself enough he doubted himself he doubted his game he doubted preparation and you know one of the joys for me is seeing someone like Kevin who's now um, in the final of Wimbledon probably one of the greatest sports event in the world um, in the final waiting for the winner of Rafael Nadal and Djokovic who are playing right now uh, he, someone like that realizing their vision through hours and hours of dedicated um, belief and um, doing something they maybe felt they couldn't have, have achieved years ago. So that for me is a great joy. Love that. Yeah, that must be uh, quite a feeling, especially today of all days. That must be, uh, you must be on some kind of high right now um, after watching that. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to, I'm probably going to surprise you. I'm super, super happy for him, but I don't live through my players' results, so I don't have very high, I don't have high highs and low lows, um, like some coaches do, because at the end of the day, it's a game, and, right. um, you know, I, I was reading a few tweets on Twitter from, you know, the, soft, the, the Football World Cup in England, and, you know, England did amazingly well, and, and Gareth Southgate is, is a fantastic coach, you can see he's also a guy that is very in touch with empathy and kindness and gratitude and all these things but you know all these you know some of the players putting tweets out there that they're they're devastated they're gutted I get it you know it, it, you know you're disappointed you didn't make the final but you know what's more important for me those kids that were trapped in the cave the, yeah. you know those those that soccer team trapped in the cave for a week whatever it may be now now that's devastating you know um yeah. hurricanes uh tragedies that's devastating that's that's real life for me sports is not nothing is devastating in sports right. um you know Perspective. and in sports you know what you get another chance yeah you, you get another chance and uh, you know the tough times only make you stronger and that's that's 100 percent what champion minded people are about wow yeah no it is it's it's um i think sometimes as an athlete you can get caught up in in, in the winning and the losing and but at the end of the day like you said it's it is just a game um and i think people might take that um they take it a bit too far but i mean as i've gotten older since i've been playing um you come home you get to go to sleep and then the next day like you said you get to play again you get to train again yeah do some and you get another chance but some people don't get other chances so it's all about perspective yeah exactly but, um you know, it's this is why I want I encourage a lot of the players I work with to to be part of charities, to be part of foundations, to give back, to to visit hospitals, to to be with kids, to be
be part of autism days and all these type of things to, to just give back because it is a privilege to do what you do, to play sports, to have a coach, to have a team. Um, you, you know, there's, there's millions of millions of kids out there who don't get that opportunity. So, you know, I appreciate. No, absolutely. Yeah. Um, going into, um, your opinions on, on athletes, um, what do you make um, an athlete coachable then? Um, you know, I had I had uh, I had a guest on a few weeks back or maybe months back, uh, Marcio Sicoli, who's the was the Olympic coach for women's volleyball at the Olympics. Um, he's he's the head coach at Pepperdine now. Right. Uh, fantastic guy. I met him when I was in California uh, speaking at Pepperdine University and. Uh, Marcio said everybody, you know, it, it, it stuck out for me is that everybody is coachable. Um, it, it just takes us as coaches or teachers, whatever it may be, to be able to tap into that. To, you know, one of the biggest mistakes coaches make is trying to build or earn the trust too fast. You know, right. I, if I meet somebody in the street and they give me advice, why should I take that advice? They might have great advice, um, they might be very knowledgeable. But but I don't trust that person. I don't know that person. I need to have a relationship with that person before I take on their advice. And I think co being coachable is about trust. Um, you know, everybody's coachable, but you have to build up that trust and that relationship first. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, empathy comes in there is that, you know, maybe it's not the right time for that person in front of you to receive that information. Maybe that person in front of you is going through tough times and the last thing they really want to do is be coached their head right. is their head is somewhere else they're going through a divorce they're going through a relationship a breakup they're going through financial struggle they're, they're ill whatever it may be and here we are as coaches coming down hard at them telling them they're not coachable whatever it may be on the other hand you are going to get players who feel entitled or who have been maybe brought up with a silver spoon in their mouth that Everything's mm -hmm. been done for them. Everything's gone their way. Their parents have made their life a lot easier. And then they feel they've become, there's this ego that gets in the way that they, that they don't become coachable because they think they know it all. Yeah. Uh, you know, greatness lies in having less ego and more appreciation for learning every single day. You know, you can wake up and learn. Uh, with that that mindset and just having a life uh, a lifelong learner's attitude, um, it's it's one of the best ways to to live. Yeah. Um, so you talked about empathy there, with like um, building on like coaches as you as a coach looking to you know build that trust and and build those relationships with with your players with your athletes. Would you say that's one of the most would you say um, a trait that most successful coaches have is the ability to build those relationships? Yeah. Um, I think it's very much about obviously connection and care. Th those two C's are important. Um, really being interested in the person and not just the player. Right. Uh, you know, there's a lot of coaches out there who are continually looking for what can I get from this relationship? What can I you know, what can this player do for me? And that's not, that's what not coaching is about. Coaching is about serving. Coaching is about making that person in front of you better than they were yesterday and, and providing them the tools that that's, you know, for me, that's, that's what coaching is. Right. And then who would you say, would you say there are the, the best coaches who do that in your eyes that you've, you've worked with other coaches? Are there any that stand out that you're like, they're probably the best of the best? Oh, it's so tough to say because, and, and to be honest, it would be unfair singling some out because sure. there's been so many and, and um, I learn from every single coach I work with or watch, regardless if they've been coaching for three months or 30 years. Uh, right. Every single, I, I just keep, I, I'm like a beginner. Um, I, I just learn from everybody, things to do, things not to do, what worked, what didn't work. I learn from my own mistakes, but I learn even more from other people's mistakes. So um, every coach has great qualities and every coach has great flaws, including myself. 
Um, right. Every day I, I screw up. Every day I will do something where I'll think to myself, and this is where I self-reflect. I don't, I don't beat myself up about it, but I'll go, hmm, you know, maybe I could have said that differently or maybe I could have, maybe I've not said that at that, that time. I could have maybe have waited for another opportunity. So, you know, it's just every day you're just, you're just challenged. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I do a bit of, of, of coaching myself just with some young kids and, you know, it's, you put sessions together and you always end up kind of steering away from them because things happen mm. that you don't anticipate. And, um, I think by, you know, you, every session you, you're learning, I come home and I'm like, what could have, what could I have done better? What could, what went well? Um, obviously I look at for positives as well, but you're always coming back and you're questioning yourself. Was that session good? How could I have done that better? And, yeah. um, I think as a coach, even more, more so than an athlete, you're constantly questioning everything you're doing to, cause you want to make sure you're, you're giving the best you can to other people, serving other people, like you said. Yep, exactly. Spot on. Um, so let me have a look here. So like you said, you're, you know, you're always looking to kind of improve your yourself all the time based on um, everything that, you know, you, you do with your, with your job is the, how important is it to you, the practice of, of self-improvement to you, to your athletes, how important do you think that is? Oh, you know, for, for me, you know, greatness, you know, the, the buzzword greatness in your life, greatness to me is self-improvement in yourself uh, spiritually, physically, mentally, relationships, your career, all these things. And, you know, funny, it's actually something I put out on Twitter today was about greatness in your life is about self-improvement, about waking up and, and trying to be better, a better person than you were the day before. And, you know, sometimes that's a challenge. Um, yeah. You know, uh, for example, at the moment, I'm in training for, for a few marathons that, that are going to be taking part later in the year in Europe and my body's tired I'm, I'm physically tired which makes me mentally tired which mm -hmm. I have to be more on guard with with the way I speak to people and my reaction because I'm, I'm physically and mentally pretty tired but I've still got a function in a function in my day-to-day -day job and as I said a high performance uh, and energy it's like an athlete you're not going to feel great all the time but you have to bring your greatness you have yep. to you have to step it up you know you, you you can't be great all the time but definitely you can give the effort and be aware of it all the time i think that's important right yeah um and um let's see here i know at on your um your what it takes uh part of your podcast you have your um your rapid fire questions and yeah. i'm just checking the time here so making sure we're we're, we're okay we're, we're good we could do another um we could do another 10 15 minutes so so we're oh. good um so i have three we can i'll let you decide we can do your rapid fire questions now or and i have three questions to ask you after that or i can ask you those three questions now and do rapid fire at the end yeah shoot the questions and, and we can get through those quick so i um okay. If you're ever in contact with me on email, you'll see my emails are very, very short and to the point. So yeah, um, I, I believe in that because you get a better message across instead of this essay uh, of, of an answer. So anyone who's out there who gets emails from me, if you get one line of word, don't feel, <laughs> um, don't feel I'm not interested. It's just uh, I will answer, but it will just be very short. <laughs> the best way to do it. Yeah. Um, what was the, the best part for you about being a, a professional athlete? And then after that what was what don't you miss about being a professional athlete um i think the time i could spend with with teammates and and um and friendships i could build up i think that was that was one of them obviously yeah. the privilege to to be able to travel a little bit i think that was that sport gave me that opportunity sure uh what don't i miss if anything uh, uh yeah um I think the financial burden, which was tough on on a on on a sport that didn't have a lot of sponsorship or a lot of support, you know, it was it was really always a month to month grind of of money and 
Um, but on the other hand, it would motivate me to to race really hard and 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 push and and win races and and you know when it comes down to it, when you need to pay bills, when you need to put food on the table, and it's you and another guy, yeah. you refuse to lose because you've got yeah. bills to pay. And and you know again that depth of how bad do you want it, and that builds grit and resilience. I I remember I remember as a 15, 16 year old. I mean I was I was two times South African a five kilometer champion on the road, but I would be racing against um, some athletes and some, some of the, the, the black kids in, in South Africa, and I was a kid myself, um, who would be coming from nothing. Uh, I mean, nothing. They wouldn't even have shoes on their feet. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're running for their food as well. Now, that is what I call hunger. I mean, yeah. <laughs> never mind hunger to, to succeed, but hunger to, to literally feed yourself. When you're up against someone that's running like that, then you know, that's a different motivation. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, I think that's it. Yeah. Perfect. Um, what do you want to be remembered for, um, as a coach? Uh, that I made a difference that I made an impact on, on people's lives. And I know that sound, that might sound pretty cliche and, but it, you know, it gives me great joy to see athletes that I worked on or worked with maybe 15, 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. who are now adults and some of them are even starting to get married and so on and you know um that they're doing well in their lives and and some of them have become coaches themselves and and they've just grown up to be great adults that for me is a win also uh working with professional athletes a lot of them don't have or haven't thought of their second career after they're finished their sports career because all their life they've been playing sports and I try and I think that's one of my, I think it's one of my, my big purposes as well is to help athletes transition from the professional arena where it's an unrealistic world mm-hmm. where they're getting incredible amounts of money. They're getting the best uh, table in the restaurants. They're getting parking at the front door. And then that changes once their career finishes. They're no longer the person. They're no yeah. longer uh, Mark the soccer player or, uh, you know, uh, um, Samantha, the tennis player, they're now just Samantha or, or whoever they're, they're, they're back in society, so to say. So a lot of professional athletes struggle with that after that after career. So, um, yeah, that's, it's, I I'd like to be known for someone that built relationships and helped change, um, people for the better in their life, not just their sports career. Yeah. So more, so, I mean, your, your class as a, as a sports coach, but I guess you also class yourself as a, as a life coach too, because not all athletes will, will make it to that, that pinnacle level of, of performance. Well, you know, so guess, every coach I believe is a life coach. Every coach, mm-hmm. you don't you, cause you don't coach sports, you coach people and you know, you, you know, sports is just the medium, but right. You know, you're coaching people. Great coaches leave an impact on people, not just athletes. And I want to be known as someone that uh, was able to to give my athletes the truth, as hard as it may be, um, be honest with them, maybe tell them things or that they didn't want to hear but needed to hear. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to be that coach. And here's the thing: some some athletes, some players aren't going to appreciate that or aren't going to accept that, and that's fine. You know. Um, as long as I'm true to myself and, uh, you know, I, I feel that I, I did what I should have done for the betterment of that person, I'm not always going to get it right, but, you know, I'm okay with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, at the, the final question, I would say, is what is champion-minded to you? Champion-minded to me is waking up each day, making a difference, going to bed at night knowing you couldn't have done any more, uh, knowing that you couldn't have given any more for, for in that day, no matter what field you may be in, um, whatever it may be, but it's, it's basically getting the most out of yourself, driving yourself, putting your head back on the pillow at night and saying, I couldn't have done any more. And that's what drives me. That's, that's champion-minded to me. Awesome. Love that. Um, so, yeah, then just uh, on to your... Your uh, unique uh, rapid fire 
Yeah. Oh, well, now now I'm in the firing line. The guns, That's it. <laughs> the guns have changed direction. <laughs> That's it, man. Um, so number one, I mean, what, what what's your rule? Three words or less? Uh, yeah, one word or or one sentence. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Okay. So number one, what's your favorite hobby? Uh, writing, um, or reading. Writing or reading. Favorite band or musician? Oh boy. Oh, you'd think I should know these, right? I mean, I I, <laughs> I listen to so many different, so much different music because of the moods I'm in. Um, what did you last listen to? What's that? What did you last listen to? You really want to know? Yeah. That's, that's Ariana, good, Ariana Grande. <laughs> <laughs> Which song? Album or song? Uh, her her latest song. Um, oh, nice no song. more tears left to cry. I think it is. She, oh. she's, She's from Boca Raton, where I am, so we support local. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, what's your favorite sport to watch? I have a few. Uh, rugby, uh, soccer, yeah. Tour de France, and tennis. Beautiful. Um, this wasn't in my questions, but uh, World Cup final Sunday, Croatia or, or France, who you got? Oh. I... I think France are going to do it, but I'm terrible with predictions like that. So <laughs> I think France are going to do it, but it would be, it would be special to see a country like Croatia do it as well. So. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm I'm with you in that one. Yeah. Um, favorite Olympic sport. Uh, definitely track. Um, nice. Swimming's pretty cool as well, but you know I, I love watching track. I love watching all the routines and rituals of, and the preparation. So I like looking at, a lot of the things except the actual event. I like to I like to see what goes on around that because that's very much my industry about performance. Right. I know yeah. that was longer than a sentence. Sorry. Yeah, I <laughs> <laughs> I'm breaking my own rules here. Breaking your own rules. Yeah. Uh, last book you read? Uh, Emotional Intelligence 2.0. Oh, nice. Uh, favorite food? Uh, living in South Africa for a long time, I'd say a braai, uh, a South African barbecue. Oh, nice. And Nando's. Nando's chicken. Nando's? <laughs> yeah. Big, big fan. Cheeky Nando's. Love that, man. Love Nando's. Um, favorite movie? Dumb and Dumber. Decision. Jim Carrey, Canadian. Love that as well. You, you know why? Uh, because I'm, I'm sometimes, I can take myself a little bit too seriously sometimes, which is, which is not a good thing. And, and I put a lot of pressure on myself to perform at a high level every day. So, yeah. Just switching off and watching something stupid is just <laughs> is just great. <laughs> that, that nails it. Absolutely. Uh, favorite sports team? Uh, big Liverpool fan and um, All Blacks rugby because of their culture. Nice. Um, I was going to ask you your thoughts on the Champions League final, but I don't know if I'll have enough time for that, so we'll save that for later. Um, favorite country or place to visit? Hmm. I would say, you know, so many places have different for different reasons. New Zealand's nice. Um, Amsterdam is nice. Nice. I like cool. LA. LA, yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Those would be the top three. Yep. Yeah. Decent. Uh, tea, coffee, or protein shake. Protein shake because it helps me recovery, but I'm a I'm a coffee addict. <laughs> no, Love seriously, I, I drink between five and eight cups of coffee a day. Really? Yeah, I'm fueled on on caffeine. So. Wow. <laughs> what What if you have under? What if you have about three or four? It doesn't cut it. I just love the taste, and and it's just part of part of my day. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Uh, favorite athlete. I would say woman would be Paula Radcliffe, who who holds the world women's marathon record at two fifteen, which is just an incredible, incredible time. Yeah. Um, Man, I'd say Richie McCall, not because he has the same last name as me, but just an incredible leader and player for New Zealand for for I think one hundred and fifty two caps or something, in one wow. of the most toughest sports. So yeah, those two. Nice. Uh, one word that describes you best. 
disciplined. Nice. Biggest pet peeve? Uh, people eating with their mouths open and people that scrape chairs in, oh. in restaurants. Terrible noise. <laughs> um, favorite coach? Favorite coach? Ooh. Current? Um, either current or, or former. Mm. Let me get hard. Yeah. Um, let me think about that favorite coach. Oh man. I mean, obviously I, I enjoy a lot of John Wooden stuff. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to say it was my coach in high school, uh, Caroline Foster. And she was, she was tough. She was tough. You were scared when you went to practice, but she, she was a huge part of my, my life. Nice. Yeah. Um, best impulsive buy. You know what? I I don't I don't spend money on on a lot of fancy things and stuff. I'm quite a basic guy, but I do enjoy some good Nike sneakers. So nice. Um, I'm guilty of that, <laughs> especially the ones you can design. I've actually got got some that should be arriving today. So guilty. Nice. <laughs> Love that. Um, what's your most treasured treasured possession of the those limited things that you have? Hmm. My most treasured possession would be. It has to be something material. Uh, it doesn't have to be no. My health is definitely my most, my most treasured possession. Um, um, my loved ones, but if I, if it was material, I'd say. Um. My phone, obviously, because yeah. uh, these days it pretty much holds everything. That happens in your life almost. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, Great but you just got to stay so answer. disciplined. You're so disciplined yeah. to not looking at it so much. <laughs> <laughs> and last one, man. What's uh, your favorite app on your phone? Um, ooh, I'm cheating. I'm actually looking at it right now. <laughs> uh, Twitter. Twitter. Yeah, nice. big, big Twitter guy. Huge Twitter guy. Love my Twitter. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, that's it. Uh, just over an hour, so we're good. Um, love that, man. Excellent, Andrew, man. You, um, I think like that, you got to start your own podcast. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow, it, it feels, I must admit, it feels pretty uh, strange to be on the other side of, of the questions that I usually ask. It's, it yeah. definitely challenges you. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of listeners out there that are really going to appreciate um you putting together all these questions. Uh, there were some really great questions that got me thinking. Um, but um, hopefully it helped you as well. Oh, absolutely, man. Yeah. Love that. But yeah, man, thanks for, uh, for taking the time to, uh, to talk to me. I didn't expect uh, this to happen at all. So uh, definitely uh, exceeded my expectations, man. I appreciate it. Well, you know what? You know, uh, fortune favors those who... Uh, don't look for opportunities, but make opportunities. And you made the opportunity, you reached out, you emailed, so um, you made it happen. So there you go. Beautiful. Cool stuff. All right. Perfect. Thanks, Andrew. And thank you. Thanks, Alistair. All right, guys. There you have it. A big thanks to Andrew. Uh, remember, you can follow me on social media, on Twitter, at Alistair McCaw, on Facebook, McCaw Method. Instagram, be champion minded, and on Facebook, McCall Method. So, as always, remember you were made for greatness. Now, go do the work. Until next time, stay champion minded, my friends.